Welcome back. Just to remind us where we are in Lewis' argument, he's, he's just begun in the last chapter his chief argument for miracles. He's already shown the existence of the supernatural, but admits that this doesn't necessarily prove the existence of miracles. Reason, for instance, might just be a way in which nature is regularly invaded by the supernatural, but the question is whether nature is irregularly invaded by, by, su by supernature, if you will. This, this irregular invasion that isn't part of the ordinary way of things is what Lewis means by miracle and what we tend to mean by it too. Lewis has said that there are, there are two ways in which someone might argue against miracles of this sort. Possibly it is the nature of nature to forbid such, to forbid such invasion, and possibly it is the nature of God to forbid such invasion in nature by supernature, irregular invasion. We're considering the first side here. Is it the nature of nature to forbid irregular supernatural invasion or miracles? Uh, in the last chapter, Lewis responded to what he considered kind of weaker arguments for this view. And in this chapter, he's taking on what, by contrast, he considers more substantive objections, or really a single objection, a substantive objection to miracle from the nature of nature, so to speak. Or as he says elsewhere, is nature safe from miracles? So let's see how he, he uh, makes his argument. Here Lewis deals with the precise relationship. This is a more philosophical chapter. So a precise relationship between miracles and the laws of nature. You'll note how, uh, that he gives a few definitions of the laws of nature and he quickly shows that these are not inconsistent with the existence of miracles. That is to say nothing in nature forbids the existence of miracles according to those ways of defining what laws of nature are. But one way of looking at the laws of nature might at first seem to forbid it. If we see the laws of nature as kind of always operative, as necessary for describing any event in nature, then it might seem that miracles are impossible since they are a violation, or at least that's what we think, or a suspension at least of the laws of nature. But, but Lewis contests this reading of things. The, the, the classic image behind a lot of this, uh, at least going back to David Hume, is that of billiard balls, you know, balls smashing into each other on the billiard table. Presumably, they operate by kind of ordinary laws of nature, which would be rendered incoherent, or so the argument goes, if such natures could just, you know, kind of willy-nilly go otherwise. So Lewis writes, quote, it is certain that the billiard balls will behave in a particular way, just as it is certain that if you divide a shilling unequally between two recipients, that, that A's share must exceed uh, the, the, half, the half, and B's share falls short of it by exactly the same amount. Provided, of course, that A does not by sleight of hand steal some of B's pennies at the very moment of the transaction. In the same way, you know what will happen to the two billiard balls provided nothing interferes. If one ball encounters a kind of roughness in the cloth, which the other does not, their motion will not illustrate the law in the way you had expected. Of course, what happens as a result of roughness in the cloth will illustrate the law in some other way, but your ordinary prediction will have been false. Or again, if I snatch up a cue and give one of the balls a little help, you will get a third result. And that third result will equally illustrate the laws of physics and equally falsify your prediction. Uh, what Lewis is trying to show here is that laws don't work in abstraction from the things upon which they are operating. They work out in a concrete world, and that concrete world constantly interferes with things in such a way that the laws of nature, while always operating in a certain way, cannot totally account for kind of ahead of time all the factors that will be in play in their operation. Note the, this helps here, note the parallel example he gives with money. The laws of arithmetic remain the same when one is playing with the stock market, for instance, and they remain the same whether the stocks go up or down, whether your predictions about the stock market succeed or fail. Similarly, I can anticipate that if I have two apples today and plan to purchase three apples tomorrow, that I will have five apples tomorrow by virtue of the necessary laws of arithmetic. What neither I nor mathematics, however, can predict is whether one of my children will eat some of the apples before I reach my final sum without me knowing about it. And this is the same with the laws of nature. The laws of nature tell us what will happen, all things being equal. But all things are almost never equal, and such a law cannot predict what will be nature's inequality. 
The laws of nature cannot account for the particulars that will shape their particular operation. An irregular supernatural agency is actually just one of these particulars of a kind of rare sort. And this allow Lewis, allows Lewis to make a clarification. He writes, quote, this perhaps help us, helps to make a little clearer what the laws of nature really are. We are in the habit of talking as if they cause events to happen, but they have never caused any event at all. The laws of motion do not set billiard balls moving. They analyze the motion after something else, say a man or a cue or a lurch with a liner, or perhaps supernatural power has provided it. They produce no events. They state the patterns to which every event, if only it can be induced to happen, must conform, just as the rules of arithmetic state the pattern to which all transactions with money must conform, if only you can get a hold of some money. <laughs> Thus, in one sense, the laws of nature cover the whole field of space and time, in another, what they leave out is precisely the whole real universe, the incessant torrent of actual events which makes up true history. That must come from somewhere else. To think the laws can produce it is like thinking you can create real money simply by doing sums. For every law in the last resort says, if you have A, then you get B. But first catch your A, the laws won't do it for you, end quote. What Lewis is doing here is arguing that what we call laws of nature are really like arithmetic, descriptions of what happens in the abstract rather than in a concrete way. They describe what happens on given phenomenon that are already there, but they don't themselves give the phenomenon. And this is precisely where miracles come in. God can supernaturally give an event to the cosmos without violating the laws of nature because such laws themselves simply operate on what God gives them to operate on. Moreover, the world of nature and of the laws themselves just are givens, no less suspended above nothing in their intrinsic being as any miracle is. But once a miracle is given, the laws of nature operate on its effects just as they do on everything else. So, so a miraculous pregnancy will gestate uh, just like an ordinary pregnancy, and nature will take its course. If God creates new energy within a total system, the total system accommodates this, and the laws of the conservation of energy presumably apply. Uh, uh, miraculous agency, as Lewis puts it, quote, is not an art of suspending the pattern at, to which events conform, but of feeding new events into that pattern. It does not violate the law's proviso, if A, then B, it says, but this time instead of A, A too. And nature, speaking through all of her laws, replies, then B too and naturalizes the immigrants as well as she well knows how. She is an accomplished hostess, end quote. <laughs> For Lewis, recall, this is just what she is always already doing with reason. Reason is an immigrant into nature, and yet nature is not in competition with reason, but is rather fully itself in relation to reason. It naturalizes the immigrant. Reason is not of her, but reason is in her. Uh, or rather, yes, reason is in her, and when, and when manifest in her, works according to her patterns, that is, works according to nature's patterns. Uh, it's become, this is an aside, but it's become increasingly common in our day to claim that miracles perhaps violate the law of the conservation of energy. Uh, there's quite a bit of discussion on this, and for those who are interested, the work of Robert Larmer seems helpful, but there are perhaps different models for stating exactly how divine miracles relate to the world's available energy. I'll forego that discussion here, but I'm, I'm flagging it as a contemporary topic of note for those who would like to pursue it further. But uh, moving on, can we, can we further clarify how miracles might be related to nature? Lewis writes, quote, A miracle is emphatically not an event without cause or without results. Its cause is the activity of God. Its results follow according to natural law. In the forward direction, during the time which follows its occurrence, it is interlocked with nature just like any other event. Its peculiarity is that it is not in that way interlocked backwards, interlocked with the previous history of nature. And this is just what some people find intolerable. The reason they find it intolerable is that they start by taking nature to be the whole of reality, end quote. 
What Lewis is doing here is claiming that his, his conversation partners beg the question. Because they think of nature as all that there is, they think it is intolerable that anything not be of nature. This appears to them to be chaotic. Uh, Lewis, on the other hand, argues that nature and miracle are interlocked by having a common origin in God and a common future in direct relationship to one another, as the effects of miracle are woven onto nature operating in its own way. But classic Lewis, he, he moves on to, to, di to dignify precisely what animates this view, precisely what animates his, his opponents, the desire for consistency and systems. Uh, he goes on, quote, the rightful demand, you know, notice that, the rightful demand that all reality should be consistent and systematic does not therefore exclude miracles, but it has a very valuable contribution to make to our conception of them. It reminds us that miracles, if they occur, must, like all events, be revelations of that total harmony of all that exists, end quote. So naturalists are actually right to love systems of harmony and consistency. But now Lewis goes even further and through, through a very fine image argues that the supernaturalist has the more elegant synthesis, the more elegant system. So he's kind of outdoing them again. He writes, quote, by definitions, miracles must of course interrupt the usual course of nature. But if they are real, they must in the very act of so doing assert all the more the unity and self-consistency of total reality at some deeper level. They will not be like the unmetrical lumps of prose breaking the unity of a poem, but they will be like that crowning metrical audacity, which though it may be parallel nowhere else in the poem, yet coming just where it does and affecting just what it affects is to those who understand, the supreme revelation of the unity in the poet's conception, end quote. <laughs> Once again, you know, you got to note Lewis' rhetorical mastery here. He's defending miracles, but precisely as non-arbitrary and according to the very values of those who deny them. He is interested in systemic harmony just as they are, but he argues that like a poem, an, an artful system contains some exceptions which reinforce and exemplify rather than reduce and negate the, the larger unity. Just as, just as the, hey, this is an, another image he used, just as the womb of a woman will never produce a child apart from the contribution of a man, so it is the case that is the, the very nature of nature to receive the miraculous, even if nature would never produce such miracles in itself. And indeed, precisely in this union, nature, relative to the whole system, is brought to fruition rather than suspended and reduced. All right, uh, so Lewis has now attempted to dispose of a few arguments against miracles from the nature of nature. He will soon move on to arguments that arise from the nature of God. But perhaps a surprise, the next chapter is actually kind of an interlude. He's gone from arguments from the nature of nature, moving on to arguments from the nature of God, but there's a little interlude here. Uh, <laughs> the next chapter is titled, A Chapter Not Strictly Necessary. Uh, you might be learning a bit about how Lewis makes arguments by this point. Uh, and you can bet your bottom dollar that if Lewis calls a chapter not strictly necessary, it might just be one of the better chapters in the book. Uh, next time we'll look at uh, and see and discover whether or not that's the case. Uh, uh, until then, though, from my giant pile of boxes to you, I've enjoyed our chat for today and looking forward to chatting with you again next time. See you later. Mm -hmm.